Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay in Baltimore. In 2002, when the AKP party came to power in Turkey, it was considered a new form of Islamic government. It was a marriage, some said, of neoliberalism and Islam, and this was going to be the alternative to the Iranian or even the Al-Qaeda model. Turkey was headed, sooner or later, everyone thought, into the European Union. Certainly many forces on both sides within Turkey and Europe wanted it. Of course, there were many opponents. But it was a system, a government, an economy that was fully integrated into global capitalism and increasingly with success. Well, now, is all of that unraveling. Incredibly complicated drama. It's going to affect the lives of millions of people in Turkey and in the region. And it's very complicated. And we're going to try to make some sense of it and introduce you to some of the main players, including a preacher, an Islamic preacher that lives in the United States, that's considered certainly one of the most influential Muslims in Turkey, and some people say even in the world. Now joining us to try to make sense of all of, the, of all this, for those of us who really don't understand it that well, and I have to include myself, is Baris Kararaj. Baris is a lecturer, in International Development Studies at Trent University in Ontario, Canada. He teaches, amongst other things, Turkish affairs. He's also the editor of the book, Accumulations, Crisis and Struggles, Capital and Labor in Contemporary Capitalism. Thanks for joining us again, Baris. Hello, Paul. So, uh, as I said, this is a very complicated story, but as quickly as you can, give us a little bit of background. Just, as, as just my starting point is, I understand that Erdogan comes to power, his party comes to power in 2002, he becomes the prime minister uh, a year later, and he's in alliance with this Amer a preacher living in the United States named Goulin, and now they have turned on each other, and it's throwing the whole project into a severe crisis. And of course, combined with that is, is the issue of the arrests of the military leaders and so on. So uh, make, some, make some sense of this for us. Uh, for uh, many people who've been following Turkish politics, uh, the recent events since uh, December 17th uh, came as a huge uh, surprise, a shock, uh, as a, a part of a, a corruption probe on uh, December 17th, uh, a couple of uh, weeks ago, uh, 47 people were detained and uh, in, including the sons of three ministers, cabinet ministers, a construction tycoon who has a really close ties to uh, the prime minister, uh, uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, and who has been really, uh, really become uh, rich, quite wealthy in the last uh, decade during the AKP rule, as well as the CEO of one of the major banks in Turkey, Halkban, the seventh largest uh, bank in, in Turkey, and these people were detained, 47 people, uh, based on charges uh, related to fraud, bribery, uh, money laundering, and smuggling gold. So it, it, Turkish, it, it was a surprise for uh, all of us, because uh, if we uh, leave aside, the, of course it's difficult to do that, but if we could leave aside the Kurdish issue and the, 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 the Turkish state's adventures in the Middle East recently, Turkish politics has been uh, quite stable for uh, over a decade since the AKP came to power in 2002. Uh, because I, I remember really, really well, uh, many people in Turkey and abroad remember really well, uh, there had not been a majority government in Turkey for about 10 years before the AKP came to power. So it was a decade of uh, uh, stability. But this... Uh, stability it seems to be over with uh, two, uh, the, the two constituent uh, components, elements of the uh, AKP, the ruling party, fighting right now. Actually, there has been, a, there has been significant tension for uh, a couple of years. Two years ago, uh, the, uh, first, first before, I do, uh, before I talk about it, I need, to, I, I need to give you some information about the, uh, those two major uh, components of the coalition. So the first one is the uh, Fethullah Gülen community. Fethullah Gülen is a former uh, uh, preacher and imam who's worked in the, and preached in Turkey for many years. I think he retired in 1981. But uh, he's, he's risen as the, uh, uh, the leader 
of this community. Now, this is the and, this is the preacher who's now living in the United States, and if I understand it correctly, very yeah, pro, very pro West, very pro free market, and so on. Yeah, uh, since 1999, uh, he's been living in the uh, he's been uh, he's he's. He's been living in a self-imposed exile in the United States, in Pennsylvania. Uh, and he has not uh, uh, gone to Turkey in the last uh, uh, 14 years. Uh, so, and this guy is not only a religious uh, scholar, uh, preacher, or imam, but he's the head of a very, very powerful uh, community. And this community has uh, been able to uh, uh, take control of important parts of the Turkish state in the last 10 years during its uh, coalition uh, with uh, Erdogan and his supporters. Can I, so, let me, just let me ask one question first. Yes. Uh, given that he was in alliance uh, with Erdogan until, what, just a couple of years ago, what, why is he living in exile all this time? Well, uh, he still, I think, has uh, uh, concerns about, uh, uh, you know, his uh, safety or, uh, you know, it's, he, he still has, he's, he, he, uh, his organization is so well-founded and strong, powerful in Turkey, that he doesn't need to go there. These, this person has been organizing since the 1970s, but particularly after the military takeover in 1980, which uh, created a significant space for him. And now he controls the police force, at least until now, he's controlled the police force, and the key uh, positions in the judiciary. Uh, and uh, the, well, this this is one component. And this is uh, this is what this is why Erdogan thinks he's driving these uh, corruption investigations and charges. Yes, uh, and he has he's actually his own community is behind these uh, corruption charges. But I would like to give you some numbers uh, to understand the power of this community. Uh, his community in 134 countries today has more than. Uh, 400, or according to some sources, even more, uh, more than 500, 600 private schools. Uh, and it has uh, 38 uh, dormitories. And uh, in within Turkey, it has uh, more than 200 private schools. It has, uh, you know, there are those uh, places where many students stay and called uh, uh, houses of uh, light, referring to uh, the movement itself. And uh, again, 460 uh, private schools that prepare secondary uh, school students for a uh, university entrance a, a examination. And on the other side, when we look at the economic aspect of this community, it, uh, we don't know the exact figures. No one knows. And some of uh, the, the capital it controls is unrecorded. But uh, many uh, sources uh, argue that it controls more than a hundred billion uh, uh, dollars uh, worth of capital. And where, where, where did this come? Where did all this come from? Well, uh, th th this is the work of uh, decades of uh, organization in Turkey, and uh, th these and they have their own business organization called Tuscon, which has uh, offices uh, from the United States to uh, Beijing to Addis Ababa and uh, Moscow, and they have completely integrated into uh, in the international global uh, circuits, markets. Uh, again, as you said, uh, some, some of the uh, defining characteristics of this person, uh, Fethullah Gülen, and his movement are that they are uh, pro-West, uh, uh, they are pro-free market, they are new liberals, right? Uh, so uh, now they're an important part of those uh, global uh, circuits, markets. And now, this is one. Bar yes. Barish, hold on. So, how religious is all of this? I mean, is, this is starting to sound like this guy Moon from South Korea. No, no, no. There's, of course, there's a quite, quite religious base uh, to all, everything that I've said. These are, in the end, uh, uh, conservative uh, Muslims. But then when I say conservative Muslims, uh, it, it, we're not talking about the uh, Islam of uh, Al Qaeda or Iran. So what are his differences with Erdogan? With Erdogan, uh, so the, the tension started in, in well, it, it started to increase in two years ago when the Gulen community tried to take control of the National Intelligence Agency, and they failed. Uh, so 
he wanted a bigger uh, piece of the pie. So this is a, a, a struggle, a fight over more political power in the country. You know, a, a struggle, a fight over uh, the control of a larger part of the Turkish state. And, and Erdogan's supporters, to some extent, I, from what I read, paint this that Erdogan is less pro-West, less believing in free markets. I mean, is that any truth to it? Or is this just a, a rivalry for power between two groups that don't have that much difference in how they would actually rule Turkey? Well, actually, uh, you're right. When we go back to the late 1990s, they converge over an ideology based on uh, a neoliberal ideology, actually based on uh, free markets, integration to the global circuits, you know, a, a, you know, a lighter version of Islam compared to the, 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 that uh, practice in, in the neighboring countries in the Middle East. But uh, Erdogan, maybe the, the major difference is that uh, while Erdogan has a more zigzag, uh, Fethullah Gülen and his community has been consistently pro-West uh, and uh, con consistently pro-neoliberalism. Uh, uh, but, but, but would the Americans... Uh... I mean, even if he's more pro-West and more neoliberal, I mean, is there any suggestion here that the Americans would actually prefer and might be encouraging him? Because you would think the de destabilization of the Turkish state is more threatening to American policy than to have, you know, this guy versus Erdogan. Well, but recently there has been some tension between uh, the, the Americans and uh, Erdogan, and Erdogan accusing the uh, uh, the. Uh, uh, the, the, the ambassador, American ambassador in Ankara for meddling with uh, Turkish uh, politics. But I think it's still quite uh, early to say something about it. But th there's another, though, uh, there's another uh, significant uh, difference and, uh, when it comes to uh, nationalism. So the uh, Gulen community has uh, assumed a much more nationalistic and, uh, you know, some would refer to as a chauvinistic attitude towards the Kurdish issue, uh, particularly recently compared to Erdogan. Now, Erdogan is, is wants to uh, have a constitutional rewrite that would give him a lot more power and see him in office a lot longer. Is this part of what's triggering all of this? It could be, but uh, those attempts, uh, you know, no one is talking about them right now. Uh, it, it's, it, it's, a, it's a power struggle within the state. That's, uh, that's how I see it. Uh, that's many people see it in Turkey. Now, just uh, quickly in terms of some of the stuff that's happening, and tell me if, I, if I'm summing this up correctly. So th the prosecutors who are going after these circles around Erdogan, which mm -hmm. every, people consider that Gulen is the guy kind of driving this, um, they were the same prosecutors that went after much of the military leadership a few years ago. And a lot of those military leaders went to jail, and now Erdogan is saying, oh, well, if, if those guys put the military in jail, and maybe they put them in jail unjustly, because I think they're going after my guys unjustly. But in fact, is what's, is, is what's happening here that Erdogan wants to make an alliance with the old military leaders and see if he can't get rid of Gulen. I think the, the, the military right now is the armed forces are uh, is uh, are more sympathetic to, to, towards uh, Erdogan. Again, it was the uh, prosecutors of the uh, Gulen community that started all these uh, trials like against, Erdogan, against the military. Valios. So they, I think, they're siding with uh, Erdogan right now as opposed to uh, the Gulen uh, movement. But uh, also, I would like to talk about uh, the uh, Iranian connection here. So one of the uh, interesting figures, uh, people who got detained and then arrested uh, four days later last month, is a, a Iranian, uh, originally Iranian Azeri uh, uh, guy called uh, Reza Zarat, and he assumed the Turkish name of uh, Reza Zarat. And uh, this guy acted as a middleman uh, to get uh, because. Uh, as you remember, in March 2012, uh, the international Iranians were banned from using the international money to, uh, transfer system called the uh, SWIFT. So, in order to circumvent this ban, these uh, sanctions, uh, to, uh, in, in Turkey, at this uh, uh, public, uh, the owned uh, bank, Halkbank, Turkey opened an account for Iran. 
so that it could continue to buy uh, gas and oil from Turkey and then pay the Iranians. So this guy acted as a middleman. What would be done is that this money would be uh, deposited in, 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 the, uh, in, in this bank, then on international markets, gold would be purchased, and through this guy, Reza Zerab, it would be funneled, it would be sent to Iran. And this continued for over a year. And in this process, what now we know, or what the allegation or the ac accusation is that Reza Zerab paid in bribes millions and millions of dollars to uh, some of the leading figures in Erdogan's cabinet. One of them is the Minister of Econ Economy, uh, Chalayan. And over, uh, in the course of only two years, uh, Zerab paid him 103 million Turkish lira, the equivalent of 49 million U.S. dollars. Pay, paid, also, them, paid them to do what? So that uh, this transfer of gold from Turkey to Iran would be, would be realized. And the same guy paid uh, the CEO of Halk Bank about almost close to $8 million in the same period. So just in short, in terms of the, the consequences of this political crisis in Turkey in the region, in terms of global politics, are we, are we really looking at anything that, that promises any kind of different character to the basic objectives of this Turkish state? I mean, the, all, everyone in this, in this story so far is essentially, you know, one way or the other, wants to be part of the Western sphere of influence. They, they, they want to stay within the global capitalism, and, and that includes the military. So, I mean, it's a jockeying for power, but is it really going to, whatever comes of it, is it going to be that significant? It is difficult to predict, first of all, the outcome of this process, this power struggle. But even if, uh, uh, you know, we knew, or, uh, you know, if, even if one of these uh, two uh, uh, parties or the uh, or components, elements of the coalition had won, I don't think that uh, much will change in Turkey. Uh, and this is mostly due to the uh, absence of a, a, a opposition with a, a counter-hegemonic uh, project in Turkey today. So uh, just in short, I mean, one thing I guess it might do, although I think this was already happening uh, uh, within the last few months, uh, Turkey's involvement in Syria, uh, you would think their eyes are not going to be very much on what's going on in Syria right now, trying to deal with all this domestic crisis. So. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and Turkey has, a, has followed a, a very unsuccessful policy, foreign policy in Syria. Uh, I would call it very spineless and uh, vicious. And it has, it has been an utter, uh, uh, a complete failure. And uh, now, again, uh, while, while uh, some people still discuss and there are some references to the humanitarian uh, crisis in Syria, of course, this is in the background. And I, before, uh, yeah. be, before I forget, there's, between, you asked the difference uh, or, uh, about the difference between uh, Erdogan uh, uh, and uh, Gulen, the Gulen community. One of the major differences also might, uh, would be their stance towards Israel, the Palestinian Israeli uh, conflict. Uh, for example, during the uh, flotilla incident of 2010, uh, Gulen uh, did not uh, put any blame on the Israeli uh, state and its forces, but it blamed the government for allowing those people to go to, uh, uh, to, go to uh, Palestine. But but uh, is uh, Gulen any? Uh, I mean, I, I actually, you have to clarify what you just said. Is is Gulen considered more or less critical of Israel? Well, in this case, he's more cautious when he voices his opposition, or when 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 he wants to voice uh, criticism against Israel than Erdogan. Again, we we should keep in mind that Erdogan comes from originally from the National Vision or Outlook Movement, which was founded in the uh, late 1960s uh, by the late uh, Prime Minister uh, Nejmetin Erdogan. And the characteristics of uh, this movement was uh, anti, or, or were, were uh, anti-Westernism and incredibly towards a free market. 
Right. But my, my understanding during the, during the Gaza flotilla business uh, that Erdogan was, you know, in terms of rhetoric and sort of public positioning, very critical of the Israelis, but in reality didn't do much. Uh, there was still military cooperation going on, lots of economic cooperation going on. Uh, you know, he didn't, you know, his opposition to what Israel did to the Gaza flotilla not, didn't, didn't yeah, go sure, very deep. Not but much has changed. And uh, even if they were not going on at the time or where some of these uh, relations uh, were frozen, they uh, resumed later on. But still, I think he feels that tension uh, that, uh, that, is, that uh, emerges in, within his uh, real base. So he was, for example, what happened in Davos. And uh, later on, when you look at his discourse, uh, this really critical discourse uh, towards uh, Israel, then uh, he was responding, actually engaging with his own electoral basis. And I guess in, sh in the final analysis, the army is going to decide the winner of this, are they? Uh, of this power struggle in yeah. Turkey? Yes. Uh, I doubt that. I, I, you, if, if you're uh, implying that uh, it will intervene. No, not, not, not implying it would intervene, but if Erdogan gets the army on its side, uh -huh. uh, fully on his side, and then they, it seems to me that's why he would let all these old military guys out of jail who were mm -hmm. sent there for corruption charges, which I, I, I'm, I assume the, the military will be happy with. Um, the, if the military is fully behind Erdogan, how much can Gulan do? Well, it is, it is really very, very difficult to say anything about it. But again, we're talking about a very, very uh, well-organized and powerful community in Turkey. Uh, a, a, I, recently, one of the leading figures of, the, uh, of Erdogan's circle, uh, Numan Kutumus, he wa wanted a survey to be done on the, uh, with regard to the power actual power of uh, the Gulen community in Turkey. He thought, and uh, many people with the AKP, they have maybe 3% of the electoral vote. But uh, then it turned out that, uh, after a poll, they have about 8%, but their influence could go up to 16% of the vote. So we're dealing with a very, very powerful uh, uh, community with also uh, international uh, linkages right all right well as i started in the very beginning it's very complicated we, we went a fair longer than usual trying to get into this uh but uh you know, this is a complicated issue and we will return to it because certainly what happens in turkey is of tremendous consequences to the to the region and thus to the rest of us thanks for joining us bears thank you and thank you for joining us on the real news network